to the Author to Authority podcast. And today I have an incredibly interesting guest for you. And her name is Amanda Carpenter. And she is not only a certified health coach, but she's a functional genomics consultant and a heart math certified coach men, uh, mentor. And she is a wellness expert with over 20 years assisting people reclaim and maximize their health and vitality. Now, she began her career as an orthopedic sports-related physical therapist, helping injured athletes, workers, and busy parents recover from muscular skeletal, skeletal injuries. And she shifted her professional focus when exercise and traditional medicine were not the answers to her own autoimmune immune disease. And today she helps people tap into their own wisdom to guide them to optimum health and vitality. She believes that people make changes for two reasons, out of inspiration or desperation after an injury or illness. And Amanda has dedicated her career to helping people take control of their health in order to fully live the life they deserve. And she shares her soul's mission through her work in the fields of healthcare, wellness, and safety. So welcome to the show, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So today I know that we're going to be talking about health. And you may think as an entrepreneur, well, why do I need to really focus on my health? I want to focus on making money. Well, here's the thing. If you don't have the health, you don't have the wealth. <laughs> so Amanda's so going to share with us some really... Uh, simple yet profound changes that we can all make in our lives that just bring health into focus and make it a priority without it overtaking our lives. But first, I want to give Amanda an opportunity to introduce herself and share a bit of her story. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So um, in 2010, I was that entrepreneur. I was a self-employed uh, business owner. I owned a physical therapy practice. Um, and I was three years in at that point in time and had recently made some big changes, um, took on a new larger office. We had purchased a location rather than renting, you know, that first big jump that you make as that entrepreneur. So working, you know, 60 to 80 hours a week just to see patients upon patients upon patients because we needed more and more and more to pay the bills. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know how that is as an entrepreneur, yeah. right? Those first few years. So, so you, you make started, the big leap and then you have to work to actually get there. <laughs> you do. And you work your butt off and you make sacrifices and you let go of, you know, friendships. You start telling your friends that you're not able to hang out and do things. And so you let go a lot of your previous, you know, social life and what you were doing to take care of yourself and exercising and, and that sort of thing. So in 2010, um, early in 2010, January, February, I started to not feel so, so good. And I, I thought at first, well, you know, it's really just because I had too much sugar over the holidays. I haven't been exercising you know, I was coming at it with my orthopedic brain. I'm starting to gain some weight. I need to get exercising again. And I started to have significant headaches. Um, something that concerned me was I was having a little bit of brain fog and difficulty mm. learning new things and s severe fatigue, severe fatigue. And at first I thought, okay, you know, I'm just, I'm working a lot of hours. I need some more rest. Went to my doctor. She ran a series of blood tests, didn't find anything that first month. Went back the next month. I'm still not feeling good. Another, after three months, she said, on paper, you're perfectly healthy. You know, you look great on paper. But something just, you know, wasn't right. I knew it wasn't right. And she said, you know, all I can offer you is antidepressants. You're self-employed. You're an entrepreneur. You're busy. You know, you probably have some, some stress and anxiety going on in your life. That's all she could offer. So she had, had thought that maybe it was all in my head. And a, a bit of the, that had some truth, but not, not as though the way that she, she meant it. So I then turned to integrative medicine and figured, okay, well, you know, if there's nothing wrong with me, there must be some sort of imbalance. And um, a few months in, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. So at that point in time, um, as a physical therapist, I had the, the wonderful opportunity to work in Lenox, Massachusetts, near Mark Hyman's Functional Medicine Clinic. So when I was diagnosed with autoimmune, I said, okay, I'll turn to functional medicine and identify, you know, root cause, what can be done. So I went to a doctor associated with his clinic and found out that this isn't, this isn't autoimmune, this is Lyme disease. And because my tests were negative and I believed in traditional medicine, um, I denied wanting antibiotics. Nope, don't want antibiotics. I continued to get sicker and sicker, had some additional stress going on in my life. My headaches were becoming more severe. So finally I gave in and agreed to antibiotics. 
Mm -hmm. 20 months of antibiotics and thousands of supplements later, I still wasn't feeling myself. Wow. Um, a, a dear friend turned me on to functional genomics. And um, I met with a functional genomics counselor and found out that my definition of healthy and society's definition of my body's definition of healthy and societies were slightly different. So I started to do some things that were specific for my um, particular health. One example is kale was big at the time. You know, you juice kale, you drink kale. I had it in my morning shakes and it literally felt like shards of glass in my belly. And there was, there was some truth to that. Um, when I had my genetic testing done, I found out that kale wasn't so good for me. So made some additional changes. Um, and started to feel a little bit better. That was the biggest jump that I had made at my health at that point in time. Mm. But what I realized is my gut had shut down. Mm. I would eat something and it would take three or four days for that food to go through me. I had killed off all of you know, the bacteria and the microbes in my body, but I was left with a, a dead battlefield. So I really started to dig into the research on my own, you know, outside of what I knew as a traditional uh, sports-related physical therapist and realized that I had destroyed my mitochondria. Mm. And now, the mit Amanda, I'm mm -hmm. going to stop you for one yeah. second there because you used a couple of terms and I just want you to quickly explain them. Um, sure. So what's genomics? Um, it's, so everybody, everybody's heard of genetics, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're born with a certain um, you know, pattern or we're born into a family with a certain pattern. And um, genomics has to do with the expression of those genes. So epigenetics is the new term of, you know, we have, if somebody says, well, you know, my parents had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. It's a genetic problem. Mm. And so what I say to those people are, do you have the same diet, the same lifestyle and the same thoughts as your parents? And of course it's always, you know, no. So the expression of those genetics may not happen. So genomics is the, the tendency of our body to um, have a certain pattern to it, but whether or not that's going to express or not is really dependent on our lifestyle. Okay. And that's what's so, so interesting, yeah. So the other term, and then I'm gonna let you go back is uh, what you just said was mitochondrial. Yeah, so the mitochondria are our cells powerhouses. And you know, we learn about that in um, traditional medical training, but you know, what do we do to stimulate that and how important they are? We never, we never really learn. And um, so when I, when I finally dug into the research and realized that I had to stimulate my own mitochondrial function, there was a lot of things happening um, at that point in time. The uh, Bulletproof Coffee was becoming big. Dave Asprey was becoming big. He was starting to talk about the mitochondria. Um, Mike Mutzel is a, is a functional medicine uh, scientist. He was starting to talk about the mitochondria. So I started to really look into that and realized that there were certain foundational things for my health that I was not doing. Mm -hmm. So for example, getting um, adequate sunshine, you know, we demonize the sun in our society. So I was doing everything I possibly could to protect myself from the sunshine and, you know, wearing sunglasses all the time and covering my body with chemical laced uh, sunscreens. <laughs> so that was one thing I wasn't doing. Another thing was getting adequate cold. You know, mom always says dress, dress warm when you go outside, cold isn't good. Well, a little bit of cold stimulation when we don't have adequate sunshine actually can stimulate the mitochondria. So, um, so I started to do some things to stimulate my mitochondria and that's when I finally got my health back. And then the last piece of it was, you know, the common denominator of everything is um, any place we go, we always take ourselves with us. So mm, yes. I realized that, um, you know, if I wanted to feel good in all environments, there was something that I needed to do to take care of myself. And that's when I happened to bond heart math. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Yeah, yeah. That was really interesting. And I'm sure many people can relate because... You know, we go through these things and people don't have explanations for them and the doctors don't have explanations. Mm -hmm. So the only thing they can say is, well, it must be in your head. Right. Well, I guess some things could be in your head, but other things, yeah, that feels pretty real to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And we know our bodies better than any healthcare provider. You know, we, so when we say something's not right, I've really learned to listen to my patients mm -hmm. in the physical therapy office. They know just because I don't know as a, as an expert, um, doesn't mean that they don't know, you know, it's just out of my toolbox. Yeah. I actually had a conversation with my um, daughter-in-law on, on Friday it was with her for Valentine's day. 
and I said to her, you know, um, you know, you are mom, right? To my nine month old grandson and you know him better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so don't be afraid, you know, to, if you feel like something's not right with your child, you know, and you need to go get it checked out, then go get it checked out. Cause mm -hmm. you know what? You're mom. <laughs> right. Right. And you know, this child better than anybody else. Exactly. Yeah. And I would say that same thing to an adult. You know, if you go to a doctor and the doctor says there's nothing wrong and, and your gut, something still doesn't feel right. You know, go to an, go to another doctor, you know, keep looking for answers until something resonates. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So I know you came with some really good practical hints, tips, and advice for us today. So I'm going to let you go to share in uh, those areas. You had mentioned cold exposure. I know you're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, you had mentioned grounding and eating whole food. So I'm going to let you go to, to share that knowledge with us today. Yeah, thank you. So in stimulating our mitochondria, there's some really simplistic things that we can do. Um, and two foundational things are getting sunshine exposure, or if the sunshine is not available, getting cold exposure. So sunshine exposure, early morning light can kind of set our circadian rhythm, which is the, the balance of the hormonal cascade in our body to give us natural energy. Oftentimes we wake up and we drink coffee, but if we wake up and we get natural sunlight in our face as soon as possible, it doesn't mean you have to go outside, but just go into a window where the sun is coming up. Even if the sun is not out yet and it's cloudy, getting that natural exposure can help to, to boost and activate our system. In the wintertime, I lived in the Northeast, I'm in upstate New York. It's actually snowing um, out there terribly today. Yeah, me Many, too. You too, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so in the wintertime when we don't have adequate sunshine, you know, a lot of people talk about seasonal affective disorder and using special lamps. And at one point in time, I had looked into that. But then I realized when I really kind of dug into the research and was listening to some other experts in the field, that cold can stimulate our, our mitochondria. So in the wintertime when we don't have adequate sunshine, we can get cold exposure. So I started doing things like taking the dog out without a jacket on. Now I had to change the story that I told myself in my head because mom always said, oh, if you get cold, you're gonna catch pneumonia. Well, if that's the story I'm telling myself in my head, yeah, I'm gonna get cold. So instead I would say, you know, this is invigorating and I'm stimulating my, my mitochondria. And that made a big difference. And to this day, I don't, you know, unless it's way below zero, I don't go outside with a jacket on. I don't overdress for the warm. Um, I think that has a lot to do with why people get um, seasonal affective disorder is, you know, we stay too warm in the winter time and we're not getting adequate sunshine. So we have no way to stimulate the mitochondria. If the mitochondria are not active and healthy, um, and being stimulated, then we have no energy, you know, and if we have no energy, we're going to fall into the state of depression, you know, some people call that, but really it can be a fatigue. So those are, those are two key things that we can do to really stimulate. Um, now we can trick our system and I've been tricking my system for a few years now. Um, I start my showers off as cold as I can stand it in the, in the morning. So <laughs> The, uh, the shower is on the third floor in our house. And what I do is I hop in the shower and still after three and a half, almost four years, I have to psych myself out for it. And every once in a while, my husband will hear me scream. So I get all psyched out. I get in, stimulates that cold. And it's so invigorating. Like it kind of, it also resets your nervous system. It's so invigorating. And then I practice gratitude, which is actually very good for us as well as that cold water shifts to warm water um, and it makes it up <laughs> onto that third floor. So again, something just, you know, totally doesn't cost me anything to do that and really starts my morning off well when I do that. Um, and then getting, you know, as much sunshine as I possibly can. I'm just back now from Sedona, Arizona. I was out there taking some myofascial release courses um, for my physical therapy under my physical therapy license and out there, of course, I got some shine and now I'm back in the Northeast and I'll get some cold exposure. So yeah, so that's the mitochondria. You want me Actually, shift right this to winter hasn't been too bad. We've had a lot more sunshine this winter than most winters. And I find my mood is a lot better. I'm not mm -hmm. feeling, you know, and I know it's directly related to, to the sunshine. I remember one year, I think we'd had one sunny day all winter. 
Mm -hmm. And I live in central Ontario, Canada. So it's like winter is like six months of the year from right. the very first beginnings to the very last. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember that year, everybody was down. Everybody was depressed. Everybody mm -hmm. was just like not motivated to do anything. But right. then, you know, once the sunshine hit, it was like, everybody was like, Oh, I can live mm -hmm. again. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And the sunshine is something we don't tend to, um, you know, if we, if we go outside or we're sitting in a, near a window where the sunshine, we're hiding from that, but the cold, we can consistently hide from that. We can overdress if we go outside, we can keep our homes really warm, you know, so that's one area where we could be stimulated in our mitochondria and we're not. Awesome. Yeah. So you have two other areas you wanted to talk about today. So the first one's grounding. Yeah. So earthing or grounding, there's some great resources out there. Um, Clint Ober is probably the leading expert on grounding um, in the world. He's, there's some documentaries out there, great, great resources. He's got a book. Um, so really what grounding or earthing is, is touching our bare skin to the earth. So the earth has a certain vibrational frequency um, referred to as the Schumann resonance. And when we touch our bare skin, our bare feet or our hands to the earth, we're something that's rooted into the earth. So if I'm doing some gardening and my hands are in the soil or touching plants, what happens is that an earth, earth can give us ions, which rebalances our system. Our system, we're really energetic beings and um, electrolytes, key trace minerals help to keep a charge in our body. And the earth gives us some freebie electrons. Mm. Now we're the only animals that wear shoes. You know, I, I don't put shoes on my dog. We don't put shoes on cats. You know, there's no wild animals out there wearing shoes. So there's something to be said about that. We really, as human beings are animals. And so when we touch an, uh, that earth and kind of engage in nature, we can actually get that boost to our system, helps to decrease inflammation, helps to thin blood. The benefits go on and on and on. Another freebie sort of thing. So when we're walking around in insulated, you know, shoes, rubber soles all the time, we're not getting that benefit. So simply taking our shoes off and sitting barefoot or walking barefoot on the earth, as long as it's, you know, good, clean soil and you're not going to step on anything that, that cuts you, um, or gardening, you know, engaging in nature, um, doing gardening in, in good, pure, organic soil, not necessarily full of um, herbicides and pesticides and chemicals, but um, digging in the dirt is actually really good for us and playing with those plants. I work a lot with arborists um, in the safety realm. Mm. And what I find super interesting is they're touching and engaging nature all day because they're touching the trees. And they don't tend to have the Lyme disease and the other chronic illnesses that the rest mm. of us have. So, you know, their biggest concern is being able to stay in the industry for a good long career because they're industrial athletes and they're working and they're exercising their bodies a lot. So they tend to wear out, mm -hmm. but they don't tend to get the other chronic diseases that the rest of us get. Um, and what really just amazes me is the Lyme disease. You know, they're in the mm -hmm. trenches getting bit by ticks all the time, but yet they don't get as sick as other people. So I think there's really something to be said about that you know, the, the benefits of what I call foundational health, engaging in nature, eating whole foods, um, you know, making sure we're getting cold and sunshine exposure, those sort of things. So I did once try grounding in the winter time, walking barefoot on snow, wouldn't recommend it. There's nothing that I recommend to my patients or my clients that I can't tolerate. That would be one of them walking barefoot in the snow, burned the heck out of my feet, couldn't tolerate it at all. So um, in, the, in the winter time, we can take our gloves off, we can touch a tree. Um, you know, it's hard to get those, that earthing in and the negative ions in the winter time, which is why I think we get a lot of the electrical shocks. We don't tend to get a lot of electrical shocks in the summertime, but yet in the winter time we do. And, you know, is it simply because we're not touching and engaging in, in nature and balancing out our energetic systems? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the third one, eating whole foods. Yeah. So um, I have explored so many different specialty diets and um, going back to the nineties where it was a low fat diet and eating a lot of sugar. And, you know, I've never been more overweight in my life when I did that <laughs> to the ketogenic diet, to the paleo diet, you know, you name it. And what I have realized is people will ask me, what's the ideal diet? in studying everything that I have ever studied and, and um, being certified in functional genomics, everybody is slightly different. But one of the mm. things that I can say is as a foundation, our body is meant to eat whole foods. Mm. So foods that either come from the earth or an animal that roamed the earth. 
not food products. Food products are something that are man-made in a factory. And if we look at a, at a label and there's ingredients in there that I wouldn't have in my normal everyday kitchen, then it's likely a food product. And our body's really meant to run on whole foods. You know, so what really resonates with me is, is definitely a whole foods diet, meaning foods that came from the earth or an animal that roamed the earth and seasonal and regional. Mm -hmm. So the way that our body, um, the way that our metabolism is set and the way that our body is sugar burning versus fat burning is set has somewhat to do with the angle of the sunshine. Mm -hmm. And as human beings, we're similar to bears. So bears eat all summer long, long hours, and they're eating nuts and they're eating berries. And, you know, they're not eating super, super fattened stuff. They're eating a lot of what we would consider carbohydrates, but they're eating for very long hours of daylight and they're actually putting on fat. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets cold enough and they're exposed to the cold, they go into the hibernation, the body, their body taps into the, the brown fat, and we call it brown fat activation when the cold stimulates and we go into a fat burning. So we are we're very similar to bears in that if we're in a cold environment, you know, carbohydrates during the summer or regional seasonal food. So what would grow in our region? Mm -hmm. And then in the wintertime, um, also going into regional foods. So what would be available in the wintertime? So what I have done um, in the summertime, I eat seasonal and regional. So I wouldn't eat fruits that wouldn't grow outside of, um, you know, upstate New York. So I'll do cherries and I'll do apples and I'll do pears and grapes and things like that. But I don't tend to eat tropical fruits because they don't grow in this region. And the, then in the wintertime, I do more of a, um, of a type paleo kind of modified ketogenic diet. So I'm doing more fats, getting that cold exposure. Um, and that's really helped to balance my, my own system out. And like I said, everybody is slightly different because depending on where our ancestors came, about, came from about three generations ago, you may be better able to burn carbohydrates than I am able to burn carbohydrates. And that, that's where the slight differences come in. Um, what I have learned is that foundationally, whatever we absolutely love as children for whole foods, you know, not Twinkies, um, but for whole foods versus what we didn't love as children, that's what our body is actually set to run on. So one example, you know, if a child doesn't like kale and you can't get them to eat kale, there's probably something about that. Mm -hmm. When I look at people's genetics and we, we can actually see the way that their body produces enzymes and how they break down foods, they tend to go back to, you know, oh, I, I loved that in childhood or I couldn't stand that in childhood. But then, you know, society says this is good for me or not. And then our head gets in the way. And going back to what my doctor said, it's all in your head. In a way, she was right, but just not the way that she meant it <laughs> um, at all. So, yeah, so seasonal and regional whole foods is really what resonates. You know, it's funny that you, you said what you liked as a child because even as a child, I've always loved salad, like just yeah. a really, mm -hmm. you know, iceberg lettuce, whole ton of vegetables mm -hmm. and some really good dressing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cheese, gotta mm -hmm. have cheese, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and even now, um, you know, one of the things I really enjoy is just you know, having that, that bowl of salad and I've incorporated some other ones. Um, mm -hmm. there's one I particularly like now it's got like seven superfoods in it. And so, I, you know, I've been experimenting with different types of salads, but mm -hmm. yeah, even as a salad, like put me in front of a salad bar and I was happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And those are the kinds of things that I hear from people. And then when we look at the genetics, they're better at burning that type of food as fuel and breaking that down. Um, there's some things that are in plants that can be damaging to some people and not to others. Oxalates are one of those and oxalates are plants protective mechanisms. Mm. So for example, I don't break down oxalates very well. So I don't do well with a lot of um, leafy greens and, um, and plants. I have to be super careful with that. But as a child, you know, I didn't like kale. I didn't like spinach. I didn't like beets. I didn't like a lot of those um, foods that actually have those oxalates in them. But I convinced myself, you know, beets are good for my liver. So I'm going to eat beets because they're so good for me. Or kale is good for detox. So I'm going to eat that. So my brain convinced me that it was good. But in childhood, I didn't like that stuff. So I would say keep eating your salads. <laughs> 
Now, what about things like um, uh, probiotics and stuff like that? Because you talked about earlier the fact that your gut was pretty well dead. Is probiotics something that you recommend? Well, that's a great question because that's one of those supplements that when I was really sick, I could not get myself to take my probiotics. And I didn't know why. And I beat myself up over it. And my my treating practitioner was like, you have to take those. And I didn't, I didn't know why. And then years later, as I learned more and more, I realized I was putting the wrong microbes in my body because my microbiome is different from somebody else's microbiome. Mm. And so the ones that I was taking, my body was not, you know, drawn to those. And so I've actually, I work with a lot of really chronically ill people um, who are in the midst of Lyme disease and being treated by a Lyme practitioner and I see that from time to time that they just have a hard time with their probiotics. And um, so that's one thing I think that intuitively, what are we drawn to versus not? I think we do need to be engaging in nature more often and those microbes from the soil make their way into our gut. Mm. Um, that's really, really important. And then there is a product out there. It used to be called Restore, but now it's Ion Gut Health that actually has some um, prehistoric microbes in it. It's not it's considered a probiotic by lay people, but by the medical practitioner who uh, developed it, Dr. Zach Bush, he's a functional medicine doctor. He used to be an oncology expert. Um, it's really not a, a probiotic, but it's, my, it's, it's actually um, by lay people referred to as one. I, now, I've never seen that bother anybody. And that's really helping. It's got some soil-based microbes in it. And it's really helping to balance the gut. Um, even my dog, if she gets diarrhea, I'll give her a few doses of that and her diarrhea will stop in a heartbeat. Mm. So that's what resonates with me. I've never had a hard time taking that. Um, I've never seen any of my clients have a hard time taking that. But when it comes to probiotics, I've seen a lot of people that just can't follow through on taking that. And I think when it comes to anything, when it comes to something we're eating, whether it be um, a certain food that the doctor says we have to have more of such and such, and we just don't like it or have a hard time taking it there's some intuitive wisdom in that. You know, are we being non-compliant and do we really need to shame ourselves or our doctor shames us into not doing something? Or is that our intuitive wisdom saying, whoa, wait a minute, that might not be good. I've mm -hmm. seen that happen enough times that now when I see that, I automatically go to intuitive wisdom because I've seen it proven time and time again, when we really dig into things, there's a reason that that person shouldn't be taking that or it's not good for them. Now, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of my kids absolutely hates vegetables and only likes meat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, you know, we were always trying to make sure that he had some balance in his life. But so if he really hates vegetables that much, is that possibly a good thing? You know, that's so interesting. That's a great question because that exact scenario is my father. So my father has been teaching me lessons my entire life since I was a six-year-old girl and he had a major logging accident, which is why I do what I do in the safety realm. So long about, probably about 10 years ago, I was like, Dad, he never liked vegetables. He always craved salt, and craved salt, but no other spices. Very simple meat and potatoes kind of guy. And I was like, you've got to have more vegetables. So I actually started him on greens, like dehydrated organic greens. And I caused pancreatitis, which is a super um, potentially life-threatening condition. And again, years later, I realized, oh my goodness. So he had a hard time with the iron that was actually in the greens. Mm. And that iron oxidized, causing uh, free radicals that damaged his pancreas and sent him into that. And again, wow. until years later, I was like, oh my gosh. You know, so society told me that greens were good. And the traditional medical stuff that I was reading at the time told me it was good, but his intuitive wisdom couldn't stand anything green. The only green thing that he would ever eat was broccoli, broccoli, mm -hmm. potatoes, and meat. So that's the only thing that he would ever eat. And here we are years later and realized that's why his body knew better. So, um, you know, again, with your, you said it was your son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With your son, I would say, don't push it because I could have potentially really harmed my father by pushing it. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness that happened. And I realized rather than doing, you know, uh, slow damage over the years and we quickly got him off of that. So that was the, really what got me into functional genomics. I actually was working with the same functional genomics counselor that I had used with Lyme disease with my father in that instance. And we were able to 
nail exactly where that had come from and neutralize things. And I was like, you know what, for my own health and my family's health, I've got to learn this. And that's when I did the certification. That is awesome. Yeah. So great question. Don't push vegetables. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Amanda, we are out of time for today. I do want to have you back on again, because I think that there there's more that we're, we're going to need to cover, but this has been a wonderful interview. So do you have any, just the last couple of really quick closing thoughts before we go for today? Um, just really just follow your heart and follow your gut. So we always hear, you know, we try to make these brain based decisions of, you know, this should be good. This should be good when it comes to anything, when it comes to your health, when it comes to living the life that you desire, follow your gut and follow your heart. And it it will always lead you exactly where you need to be. Well, thank you so much. This has been Amanda Carpenter and me, Kim Thompson Pinder on the Author to Authority podcast. And we will see you on the very next episode. Bye now. Bye-bye.